Good morning, Mr. Friends. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Chair. Are you able to hear me quite clearly? Uh, I have a reasonable picture and reasonable sound. Not perfect, but quite reasonable. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, hopefully it will improve as we go along. Uh, I just want to announce that uh, this week um, the evidence leader, Mr. Alec Print SC, who is going to be leading evidence relating to parliamentary oversight, is not physically here in the venue. We have not done this before. It's uh, been witnesses who have been away from the venue sometimes and appear via video link. But uh, the situation in which we are uh, forces us to explore various ways. And uh, I have allowed that uh, he appears uh, virtually and we hope that uh, this situation where both the evidence leader and the witness are not physically before me is going to be smooth but there may be some technical glitches but we hope that uh, they will not be too much uh, Thank you, Mr. Friend. With that introduction, I now uh, give you the, the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Chair, uh, with your leave, I, I propose to start with a fairly brief introductory address uh, just to uh, indicate where I anticipate this evidence uh, will be taking us. Um, As you I'm have so, just indicated, uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Mr. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Friend. I don't know whether there is some unusual delay when I speak before you hear. If there is, the technicians should try and do what needs to be done to improve that. Um, for certain reasons, uh, I suggest that uh, we swear in your first witness and then you do your brief opening address. Is that fine? Uh, Chair, I, I am struggling to hear you. I have relatively poor audio and relatively poor visuals from the venue of the hearing. Is that so? I have so? a much clearer connection uh, with the witnesses. Is that so? Um, uh, maybe, well, maybe in that event, I should allow you to do your brief opening address uh, because for that uh, you, you will just be the only one speaking because I can hear you uh, quite well, I think. Um, then thereafter and before, thereafter we might just sway in the witness and then take an adjournment to allow the technicians to attend to the problem. So I think let's start with your opening address in, instead of the other way around. Yes, uh, th thank you, uh, Chair. And, and Chair, I would request that if at any particular time you really are not hearing me, you would indicate that. Uh, but I will assume that as we proceed, you can hear what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. I, I propose to start with a brief reference to the terms of reference of the Commission. Uh, because the terms of reference 
mandate the commission not only to investigate allegations of state capture, corruption and fraud in the public sector, including organs of state, but the terms of reference also require the commission to submit recommendations to the president. So if in due course, it should be found by the commission that there was any form of state capture or that there was any significant level of corruption in the public sector or organs of state, then it will be necessary in order for the commission to make recommendations which may be of value to consider certain related issues. <clears throat> and those are firstly, whether our national institutions designed to address or to protect the country or to prevent such conduct failed to do what they should have done to prevent or to address those sorts of problems. And secondly, if so, how and why that came about. And thirdly, whether anything can be recommended which, if adopted, may contribute to avoiding or to reducing similar failure in the future. Now, Parliament is one such national institution. The Constitution imposes on Parliament not only a right, but also a duty, a constitutional duty, to exercise oversight over the executive and a constitutional duty to hold the executive accountable. Now, there are various provisions in the Constitution relevant to that. I'm just going to mention two of them. One is Section 42.3 of the Constitution, which says that the National Assembly must, and I quote, scrutinize and oversee executive action. And as the hearings on parliamentary oversight proceed, one is always going to have to have at the back of one's mind, what does that mean, the duty to scrutinize and oversee? But more so, and more directly in point, is section 55.2 of the Constitution, which provides as follows. The National Assembly must provide for mechanisms to ensure that all executive organs of state in the national sphere of government are accountable to it. That's the language used, accountable to the National Assembly. And B, to maintain oversight. So we need to think through what is the oversight that the Constitution has in mind. And it's oversight of one, the exercise of national executive authority, including the implementation of legislation, and two, any organ of state. And uh, Chair, you will be aware that the Commission has been focusing not only on departments of government, but on major state-owned enterprises, which are organs of state. Now, the focus of the evidence before the Commission this far, in the main, has been on the executive, on leaders of state-owned companies, and on persons who were engaged in business dealings with the uh, state and with SOEs. And a core question that has been under consideration in the evidence heard thus far is whether those persons, persons within the executive, within the SOEs, within the private sector and elsewhere dealing with them, whether those persons have participated in, have participated in or colluded with state capture or corruption. If it should be found by the Commission that this did occur, then it will be necessary to consider whether Parliament did what it could properly have been, what could properly have been expected of it in the exercise of its oversight responsibilities. And the focus of the present set of hearings will be on that question. That in broad terms is the question. More particularly, the focus will be on the following. Firstly, did the National Assembly properly and adequately and responsibly exercise both its right and perform its duty to firstly maintain oversight over the executive, I've quoted the constitutional provision, 
and secondly, to hold the executive accountable. Now, I understand that given the terms of reference of this commission, we ask those questions only in relation to allegations made from time to time of either state, caption, uh, state capture or corruption or fraud in the public sector. So the first question, did the National Assembly properly exercise its oversight responsibilities? Secondly, if and to the extent that it might be found that Parliament did not do so, and did not do what it should have done, then the following two further questions arise. Firstly, why and how did that come about? What explains that problem or that, that failure if it should be found that there was such a failure? And secondly, and possibly most importantly, most importantly, ultimately, what, if anything, should the Commission recommend, which, if adopted, may contribute to avoiding or to reducing the extent of similar problems in the future? Now, the Commission has received voluminous and voluminous submissions. Uh, these include members of parliament, these include political parties, these include non-government organizations, and they include academic experts. Chair, given the limited time uh, available to the commission to complete its work, and given that the uh, written material can in any event uh, be considered by the commission, it will not be possible to present all of this material orally in the present hearings. Nor will it be possible to present all that is contained in the affidavits or all that is contained in the submissions of those who have been selected and requested to testify orally. But a selection has been made of what are considered to be the most informative or useful material received, and that is to be explored in the present oral hearings. Now, initially it was contemplated that approximately 19 persons would be called to testify, albeit in some cases, uh, quite briefly. But there have been some tragic developments which I, I, I wish to deal with right at the outset. Firstly, the former Auditor General, Mr. Kimi Mukwetu, cooperated extremely closely with the Commission on the issue of parliamentary oversight. And I had anticipated he would be the very first witness to testify. An extensive affidavit by him was at an advanced stage of preparation, prepared, I may say, with enormous assistance from personnel within the Office of the Auditor General of South Africa. But as you will know, Chair, Mr. Mukwetu tragically passed away in November last year and he did so before he could sign and formally depose to the final draft of his affidavit. There is no one else at this late stage in a position to give the same evidence, but we do have the benefit of the unsigned final draft affidavit. And that draft affidavit has been included in the bundles, the written material to which I shall refer shortly, together with uh, multiple supporting annexures, which bear out in almost every instance, the content of the affidavit, and also accompanied by two confirmatory affidavits from persons uh, within the office of the Auditor General, who were intimately involved in the preparation of the unsigned affidavit. And I will be submitting to you chair in due course that the unsigned affidavit can be regarded as admissible evidence, having regard in particular to section three of the Law of Evidence Amendment Act. Although I will be submitting to you, Chair, that regard must be had with certain section, precisely because it will be only in the format of an unsigned draft affidavit. I might mention that the uh, first witness to be called will be asked to comment on certain aspects raised in Mr. McQuetu's draft affidavit. 
and certain other witnesses to follow will also be asked questions arising from it. So it will serve as a point of reference uh, for the evidence of certain other witnesses. Secondly, Mr. Jackson and Tembu, who had served as the chief whip of the majority party in Parliament from March 2016 until March 2019, and of course since then as a minister, submitted an affidavit to the Commission, in this instance a signed properly deposed to affidavit. And he would, I feel confident, have made a very major contribution to the hearings on the question of parliamentary oversight because he was the chief whip at the center of the parliamentary process in the years that are going to be of particular interest uh, and of particular importance to the questions that we're going to be dealing with. But as you know, Chair, he recently and tragically passed away. So his evidence is in the bundle. Reference will be made to it, but we will be uh, sorely uh, prejudiced by the inability of the late Mr. Jackson and Timber to testify. Thirdly, there is at least one further witness who had submitted an affidavit, uh, who had been expected to testify, who is currently not in good health, and whose health may or may not uh, enable that witness to testify in due course. But if so, it will not be this week. So where does that leave us for the present purposes? As you know, Chair, we have set aside a period of five days, Monday to Friday of this week, uh, and we will try to get through as much as we can. And I am anticipating that we should probably be able to hear the oral evidence of about 10 witnesses and even possibly more. But it is anticipated that we may in all probability need to find, if we possibly can, another two or day witnesses somewhere in the very tight schedule uh, of the remainder of the oral hearings of the commission. The evidence that we will hear will fall broadly into two categories. First, what we might call pure fact evidence. There will be evidence in the main, from members of parliament or former members of parliament, about what degree of oversight did and did not take place in certain relevant portfolio committees. Uh, and of course, oversight in respect of allegations of state capture, in respect of allegations of corruption. And the primary focus in this regard will be firstly on the Standing Committee of Public Accounts, known to all as SCOPA, and then secondly, on certain selected portfolio committees, and those are the Portfolio Committees on Public Enterprises, which of course uh, had oversight in respect of many of the entities on which there has been a great deal of attention during the hearings of this commission. Uh, also on the public on the Portfolio Committee on Transport, but only in relation to PRASA. PRASA has been selected just to demonstrate a certain tendency in a certain type of problem. And also the, uh, the Portfolio Committee on Correctional Services, and there again, only in relation to BASASA. Uh, this commission has already heard quite a lot of evidence, not only about allegations of corruption involving BASASA and the Department of Correctional Services, but also in respect of the issue of parliamentary oversight in relation to that. And there will be certain further evidence on that theme. And there will also be some, but more limited evidence about the portfolio committees on mineral resources and on home affairs for reasons that will become clear to you in due course. We will start with the evidence of the former chair of SCOPA, Mr. Timber Gordy. Now, according to the affidavit that he has submitted, he will testify to the effect that in the years during which he chaired SCOPA, there was a widespread breakdown in financial control and a continuing, ever-increasing rise in irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure. And he will say that in his view, 
Scopa performed its oversight responsibilities properly, made appropriate recommendations as regards required remedial action to be taken by the executive, and that Scopa's reports were adopted by the National Assembly. But, he will say, the irregular, the fruitless and wasteful expenditure continued to rise. In other words, that the oversight process did not result in any discernible improvement. In fact, on the contrary, the situation got progressively worse. So his evidence will raise a question, firstly, as to the extent of Parliament's oversight powers. What really are the limits of what Parliament is entitled to do? What can it be expected to do? And secondly, his evidence and a lot of the other evidence will raise the question of what, if anything, can be done to improve the effectiveness of oversight. And this, of course, is against the context of committees and MPs who are genuinely trying hard to do their best to exercise proper oversight and to, and to require proper accountability. We will also then hear evidence from a number of MPs who were active on the portfolio committees dealing, as I said, with public enterprises, transport and correctional services. Some of that evidence will be evidence of appropriate oversight exercised on occasion. But other of that evidence will suggest that steps that should have been taken by portfolio committees were either not taken at all, or if they were taken, they were taken only belatedly, one might say culpably, cul culpably belatedly, and well after such oversight activities ought to have commenced. There will also be evidence from a representative of an NGO, which has taken particular interest in parliamentary oversight in respect of allegations of corruption and state capture. And that evidence will traverse broadly across the various committees that I have referred to. Now, the evidence, this factual evidence on what oversight activities did and did not take place will require attention to be given as we go along to the following three sub-questions. Firstly, what allegations and what evidence were in the public domain at particular times? And that would include material published in the press, material made officially available to Parliament by means of reports, annual reports, reports from the Auditor General and such like. And that, of course, is relevant to, to um, forming a judgment about the appropriateness of how members of parliament and how committees of parliament responded. We have to assess, not with the benefit of hindsight, but fairly taking into account what those members of parliament and committees should have known or should have suspected or had reasonable grounds to suspect or had reasonable grounds to investigate at particular times. So I'm drawing attention to the importance of time as a consideration as we assess the questions that will be addressed. Secondly, having had some sense of what was in the public domain and what was, what was known to members of parliament or what should have been known to members of parliament, the question will be whether parliamentary structures were or were not remiss in failing to inquire into issues that they should have inquired into, whether timelessly or at all. And then thirdly, to the extent, if any, that they did not do what should have been expected, what might explain that? How do we understand that? What are the causes of this problem? So those fact witnesses in the main members of parliament or former members of parliament will deal with those issues and they will also be given an opportunity uh, to deal in passing, uh, as they testify, with the question, if they wish to comment on it, on what recommendations they suggest the Commission should make. 
I, I want to make clear that an attempt has been made to allow conflicting voices to be heard before you in these hearings on the issues that I have raised. If a portfolio committee has been criticized by one or more witnesses, an attempt has been made to enable the chair of that committee to be, have an opportunity to testify in response. But it has not been possible to achieve this in every case. Uh, one of the chairs uh, who would have testified is currently medically indisposed. When I say chairs, former chairs very often, uh, we're looking backwards or somewhat. Another chair, Mr. Smith, Mr. Vincent Smith, has taken the view that he has already contributed to the work of the commission sufficiently. And uh, we propose uh, in response to that to leave it at that. That's the first category of evidence. What happened? What didn't happen? The second category of evidence, and largely it will deal, be dealt with in the same sequence. In other words, we'll only reach the second category after we've largely completed the first category. Will be evidence and submissions from a number of academics, from a number of NGOs, from some MPs, from some political parties, about, firstly, what explains apparent failures of parliamentary oversight? And secondly, what suggestions do these persons have, the academics, parties, and so forth, as to recommendations that they suggest could be made by the Commission? Now, we may or may not reach uh, that phase of the evidence in the, present, in the five days presently set aside for this work stream. Uh, and as I've said, those same questions will be dealt with in passing by the other witnesses in turn, who will be, but, but as I say, this will mainly be, uh, folk, we will mainly hear this, this second phase of evidence after we've completed the first. It is anticipated that the very final witness, who very clearly will not be heard in this five-day session, will be a senior representative of the African National Congress, who will give that party's overall views on the parliamentary oversight issue and its views on what could be done to make parliamentary oversight more effective. And I think it's necessary that I should place on record, Chair, that all political parties represented in Parliament were invited, in fact were twice invited, if they so wished, to place evidence before the Commission or to make submissions to the Commission about the issues to which I have referred. As some of them have taken up that opportunity, others have not. Uh, finally, Chair, the parliamentary oversight material is contained in Exhibit ZZ of the files uh, of the Commission. Uh, Exhibit ZZ comprises the entire parliamentary oversight bundle at present, that bundle comprises five volumes of affidavits and written submissions. There is also a further bundle labeled Legal Framework and References. The Legal Framework part of that final bundle contains both the eighth and the ninth editions of the rules of the National Assembly. And the reason for that is that some of the events that you will hear evidence about, uh, took place whilst the eighth edition was still in place. Uh, and some went once the ninth edition had come into effect. The differences are not very material for present purposes, but that reference material is available to all witnesses and to yourself as we go along. There is also in the reference file, uh, certain other reference material, which I need not deal with now, but which we can use and refer to as we get there. And I might add, uh, Chair, that there is a further bundle that is in the process of being created uh, and that in all probability will not be referred to this week. Chair, that is all I wished to say by way of an introductory address. Uh, my proposal, as soon as you think it appropriate and convenient to do so, is that I now call as the first witness in this session, Mr. Nelson Temba Gordy. But Chair, I recall that you suggested that perhaps we might take a short break, 
uh, to attend to the question of whether anything can be done about the quality uh, of the uh, transmission. Thank you, Mr. Friend, for your open address. Yeah, I think what we should do is uh, call your first witness, Mr. Godi, and let him get uh, sworn in, and then we will take the adjournment after that. Thank you, please. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gordy, uh, if you could maybe now come on screen and, uh, and take off your mute. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Gordy, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you very well. Thank you. So I leave it to, uh, to the Commission's officials to spell you in. Good morning, Mr. Gordy. Hi, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Um, not so well. Not so well. Okay, what we are... It's better now. Okay, what we are going to do is uh, have the oath or affirmation administered to you. And after that has been done, we will take an adjournment so that the technicians can attend to uh, uh, what needs to be done to make sure everybody can hear me well. You, you understand that? Okay. Registrar, please uh, administer the oath to Mr. Godi or affirmation. He will tell you which one he, he, he prefers. Come and stand. Oh, oh, you don't have the. You need that for the. Oh, the, there is the m mobile one. Then come and stand where he can see you as well. Please state your full names for the record. And Nelson Temba Godi. Do you have any objection to taking the prescribed oath? No. Do you consider the oath binding on your conscience? Yes. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me, God. Thank you, Mr. Gordy. We are going to take an adjournment now, and uh, and uh, I don't know how long it's going to be. It's going to be uh, depend on the technicians, but I'm given an indication that it might be ten minutes. Um, technicians. Uh, is it technically possible for me to see both the witness and the evidence leader in different screens? Okay, all right. If, if it is technically possible or technologically possible, I would prefer to see both as the evidence leader ask questions and the witness answers questions uh, rather than have a situation where the leader, the evidence leader will ask a question and then he will disappear and the witness will, 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 will come up uh, if possible. But if that's going to take quite some time to, 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 to do, then we can continue in the meantime and then at some stage uh, then we can uh, change. But if it's not technologically possible, it's fine. We will make do with what we have. Uh, we are going to take the uh, 10 minutes adjournment then now. We adjourn.
is um, finish on your phone and put headphones to your phone so that you can make I can't hear you, Dr. Ao. Can you repeat that again? Dr. Ao? I'm saying I'm going to post the YouTube link into the chat on Zoom. So okay. that if people still can't hear, they can listen to the YouTube feed. Mr. Friend, I understand that uh, some improvement has been made, but uh, it doesn't solve the problem completely. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Chair, but I may say that I, I did manage to hear what you just said, so I think the improvement is, is adequate for us to proceed. Okay, no, that's fine. Let, let's proceed then. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Chair, the evidence of Mr. Gordy is Exhibit ZZ2 <clears throat> to, be found, <coughs> excuse me, to be found in Bundle 1 at page 101 and following. Yes, uh, so just for the record, uh, we will be using, um, just for the record, we will be using Bundle 1. Uh, certainly during Mr. Cody's evidence. Uh, I don't know whether that's the bundle we'll use for the rest of the day, but if there is a change, you will announce. Yes, uh, and I, I might just indicate to you, Chair, in advance that uh, halfway through or two-thirds of the way through the evidence of Mr. Gordy, I will be referring him to the affidavit of Mr. Kimi Mukwetu, the late Mr. Mukwetu, that will be in bundle four, but I will announce that when I reach that point. Okay, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gordy, uh, is it correct that you deposed to an affidavit for the commission, uh, of which you should have a hard copy available to you? Uh, and is it correct that your signature appears at page 120 at the end of that affidavit? That's correct. And have you had an opportunity in preparation for giving your evidence today to read through that affidavit? And are you comfortable that it's correct as far as you are aware? That's correct. I'm satisfied that uh, the affidavit does not need any adjustment or corrections. It, it is fine as it is. Uh, before we proceed, I'm sorry, Mr. Friend. I'm sorry, Mr. Friend. Uh, Mr. Koji, I must thank you for availing yourself to come and assist the Commission by giving evidence. 
I just, uh, I normally say that at the beginning, so I thought I would uh, say that uh, to Mr. Gordy. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Gordy, uh, I would like to start off just by giving a little bit of your personal background uh, so that we understand on what basis you are in a position to give the evidence that you do. Could you turn, please, to paragraph four of your affidavit? Yeah. Page 104. And is it correct, as we see there, that... You came to Parliament as an MP in February of 2004. Uh, that's correct, Chair. Uh, and this is thanks to the former president of the PAC, Bishop Stanley Mohuba, who wanted to give me a two months preview before the 2004 elections in April so that I can acclimatize myself in Parliament. Right, and at that time you were a you were the then deputy president of the Pan Africanist Congress. Is that correct? Yeah, that's very correct. Um, and may I add that I'm appearing before you here as a as a proud and grateful product of the PAC. Uh, yes. Now um, you did, however, as I understand it, as you say in paragraph four point six. Uh, in September 2007, uh, leave the PAC and become the founding president of the African People's Convention. Is that correct? That's very correct. One of the most traumatic moments for me politically. Now, and you remained a member of parliament all the way through until May of 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, from a fairly early stage of your period of service as a member of parliament, is it correct that you, has, that you served as chairperson of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, otherwise known as SCOPA? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I think, as my affidavit indicates, uh, I became chairperson in November. Uh, 2005. And I, I do think, Chair, that uh, it, it, it might be important just to give a little background that uh, the since 1994, the tradition uh, has been that uh, the Public Accounts Committee is chaired by somebody who is not from the majority party. So I came in as part of that tradition, taking over from someone who was from the New National Party and the IFP before and all that stuff. And you remained as chair of SCOPA from November 2005 until May 2019, is that correct? That's correct. So and yes, yeah. yes uh, effectively over more than the fourth and fifth parliaments. Correct. Right. Now, I'd like to focus next on the functions of SCOPA, and you deal with that in paragraph 6.1 of your affidavit, where you refer to Rule 245 of the Rules of the National Assembly as they currently stand, the, the, the ninth edition. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, well, just to there was, there was a similar uh, provision uh, that preceded that. Correct. So, Except that in this edition, um, 6.1.1 uh, Roman figure 4, uh, it's something that we initiated, added to the rules, which was not there at the time when I became chairperson in 2005. All right, I'll take your point, but now let's just start at the beginning. Let's just understand the core and basic functions of SCOPA. The rule says, as we read in your affidavit, the following. The Standing Committee on Public Accounts, A, must consider, Roman numerals 1, the financial statements of all executive organs of state and constitutional institutions or other public bodies when those statements are submitted to Parliament, Roman numerals two, any audit reports issued on those statements, and Roman numerals three, any reports issued by the Auditor General 
on the affairs of any executive organ of state, constitutional institution, or other public body. That, if I understand you correctly, has been the case throughout your, your period with SCOPA. Right. Right. What you're drawing attention to is that in your period, and when the ninth edition of the rules took effect, Roman numerals subparagraph four was added, which also requires SCOPA to consider any reports reviewing expenditure of public funds by any executive organ of state and constitutional institution or other public body. That, that was in due course added to your uh, official mandate. All right. I then want to draw attention to subrule 1C. The Standing Committee on Public Accounts, C, may initiate any investigation in its area of competence. That's always been part of the SCOPA uh, mandate. Is that correct? Correct. And then to paraphrase sub D, you also have to perform the same sorts of functions as other portfolio committees. You have tasks and duties concerning parliamentary financial oversight and supervision of executive organs of state. I think that rule speaks for itself, am I right? Except that insofar as it affects, it concerns parliament, uh, this was not amended, but Parliament has taken away that responsibility uh, from SCOPA and established a body that is supposed to look at the review the finance of Parliament. We only did it once. Yes. But, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So you're, you're drawing attention to the very specific issue of Parliament's right. own financing, uh, yeah, which so. uh, you're, you're correct, but is not really the subject matter or of concern to the particular uh, inquiry we're involved with. So. And then subrule two uh, says this, the speaker must refer the financial statements and, refer and reports mentioned in paragraphs A1 to 4 to the committee, i.e. to SCOPA, when they are submitted to Parliament irrespective of whether they are also referred to another committee. So your committee got all of these reports, the financial reports, including the reports from the Auditor General. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Now, what I would like to do against that background is to summarize at the outset some of your core views and contentions as they are set out at an early stage in your affidavit. And I'd like to refer you firstly, please, to paragraph 5.3 of your affidavit. Now, perhaps rather than me reading it into the record, could I invite you to read it into the record? Because this is something that you stress in your affidavit you want to emphasize at the outset. That's paragraph 5.3. That's correct. What I feel I should emphasize at the outset is that in my view, the extent to which parliament is able to exercise effective oversight over the executive is, and has always been fundamentally a political question, determined by political forces and proper application of the principle of the separation of powers. Parliament and its committees can solicit information and explanation and can make recommendations but the extent to which such recommendations are acted upon depends in practice on the integrity and political sensitivity of members of the executive, end quote. All right. I hear you clearly. We will in due course come back to that issue when we have considered some of the more substantive material that you put to the commission. I would also like you please to read into the record paragraph 5.4, because that is another point you say at the outset you wish to emphasize. I read it? Please. Right, 5.4. Another point I wish to emphasize about parliamentary oversight is that when one political party is dominant, the extent to which oversight will be effective depends on the internal dynamics within that party. Oversight by committees of parliament should ideally be non-partisan. And sometimes that is achieved, but not infrequently, Partisan political battles, including internal factional battles, occur within committees. Thank you. 
I think in fairness to you, we should indicate that there is a footnote to that, where you say in footnote one, uh, that you think Scopa largely managed to achieve the ideal of being nonpartisan. Is that correct? No, that's that's very correct, and uh, I'm sure it is it is touched upon some way. And I think it is an important factor to emphasize because that's what set Scopa apart from the other parties. The extent to which we could, as a team, irrespective of whether one came from the GAA, the IFP, the EFL, the ANC, we all operated as units. We treated each other as comrades. Um, only saving the public good, uh, it, it, it is that which actually sets us apart from all the other committees. Thank you. I want to refer you now to paragraph 6.2. And paragraph 6.2, if I I'm, can I'm paraphrase so, it in I'm, my own words. I'm sorry, Mr. Really Friend. I'm sorry, Mr. Friend. Uh, I just want yes. to ask uh, Mr. Godia a question about his comment uh, that he has just made. Mr. Godi, the point you have made that Scopa largely operated as a committee and as a team irrespective of the different political parties from which its members came and we have said that that set Scopa apart from other committees. Uh, what do you think was responsible for that? Uh, namely, for the committee or Scopa to operate uh, as a team, irrespective of which political parties its members came from, and uh, doing so for the public good, which uh, it seems implied in your evidence uh, wasn't the case with other com parliamentary committees. Hey, when I became chairperson of COPA, I found a committee that was uh, driven by divisions um, coming from the arms deal uh, work that the committee did and I set out deliberately and cautiously uh, to inculcate uh, that spirit and approach and I was fortunate that uh, members were responded because we said look if we are going to grandstand and fight amongst ourselves it is the thieves who are going to benefit it is public money that is going to be looted um, and we, we somehow managed it. Uh, I must say it was not easy. It was, it was continuous work to manage the different personalities. Uh, it, it would from time to time emerge that uh, members of a particular party would come with a particular perspective, but by and large, we managed to find uh, our rhythm. I think in the fourth parliament, that's where we laid the foundation. In the fifth parliament, I think, I think that was our best year where we had actually uh, cemented that collegial uh, relationship where whether a person is from the DA or the EFF or IFP, we worked as a team. And the political party somehow gave members of SCOPA some bit of leeway uh, on which we built. So I guess that what you are... What, I guess that what you are saying is uh, you as the chairperson uh, made it your mission to try and achieve that uh, spirit in the team and that commitment in the team. Uh, Chair, very, very much so. It was a conscious and deliberate effort. In the fifth parliament, uh, I was very fortunate to have a committee whip like uh, Comrade Nyam Boy. Uh, we spend a lot of lunch time together as a way of building between myself and him a, a working relationship that then assisted in cementing the work amongst ourselves. I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one with the members of the GA, with members, the member from the IFP, the member from the EFF, 
to really work on this collegiality because that was the only way we could do the kind of work that we did. Okay, thank you. Mr. Friend, you can proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Godi, arising from that, I just want to draw attention to paragraph 4.4 of your affidavit, in which you say that during your tenure in the National Assembly, you served on the portfolio committees on social development, labor, education, health, and trade and industry. In other words, you did have experience on other portfolio committees. Is that correct? Correct. And is it your evidence that the, the, uh, the lack of partisanship in SCOPA was quite different from your experience on the other committees to which I've just referred, or to other committees? Absolutely. 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 Thank you. Now, I'd like to take you, I just want to refer you, and this is still really introducing your views, which we're going to come to substantiate uh, in more detail later. But in paragraph 6.2, I think it's fair to say that the essence of your view is that you believe that in both the fourth and fifth parliaments, SCOPA did discharge its assigned functions. That's your view, is it? Correct. Correct. Right. We, we, we certainly did, and I think the records are there. Uh, to prove that uh, we were the one committee that really took its job uh, seriously. And I think it would be fair to say on a reading of your affidavit that you believe that your committee did all that could reasonably be expected of it. That is your view, is it? Yeah, I just want to add that uh, the last sentence in that paragraph talks to the media coverage that we got uh, which was reflective of the fact that uh, we were actually doing our work. And I must say that uh, uh, we must thank uh, the media, the journalists in Cape Town, the media houses, the community radio stations, because we made a conscious decision. If you look at uh, one of our um, strategic objectives, it was to make sure that the public knows and understand the work of SCOPA. And we could only use the media. Uh, that is why in SCOPA we refuse to have closed hearings. Whenever we had a hearing, whatever sensitivities officials said were there, we insisted it must be open so that the media could be there and could then take the message of the committee to, to the public. Right, thank you. Now, given that background that you say that you believe that SCOPA did discharge its obligations, that makes all the more uh, significant what you say in paragraph 6.3. You say in paragraph 6.3 the following, during the same period, the period during which you say SCOPA was diligently discharging its obligations. Firstly, there was in your view a widespread breakdown in financial control as reflected in the clear and emphatic reports from the Auditor General and the reports of SCOPA. So, despite you doing what you say was your job, at the same time, there was a widespread breakdown in financial control. Is that correct? I think that, that is an important contradiction to be kept in mind as we move along, because we did our work very, very well, but the outcomes of that work uh, was reflected in, 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 in the negative direction from the reports of the Auditor General year in and year out. And we will come back to that. The second point you emphasize about the same period, it's subparagraph two of 6.3, is that you say during the same period, the executive did not display a genuine political will, will to resolve this, which is, which is to say to resolve the widespread breakdown in financial control. That is part of your view, is that correct? Chair, if I, if I may, um, just to say what I mean here is that uh, when you know what the problems are, because the Auditor General reports uh, to you year in and year out, when you sometimes make decisions on what you think needs to be done 
to correct the situation and then don't follow through, don't implement those decisions, then for me, it is that there's a lack of political will. And if I could, there are three very important cases which if they were done, maybe we would not be sitting here. And if we did, it would be under completely different uh, circumstantial conditions. Firstly, in 2014, the executive took a decision that all supply chain management personnel throughout government, throughout the state, must be vetted. So that the more than 500 billion rents procurement budget, we should be assured that it is in the hands of people whose financial integrity has been tested. But that was not implemented. And when we called the state security agency, um, they said, well, we don't have regulations. The regulations that we have make it optional. And so when they tried to vet the employees at SABC, SAPS, at Transnet, at SAA, they all refused and the whole thing stopped. So you are saying if vetting had been done on your SMS personnel, maybe we could have identified and weeded out dubious characters. The second case relates to what was called the anti-corruption task team established in 2010, which was an interministerial task team chaired by former minister Jeff Hadjian, which was supposed through the DGs uh, to spearhead government's fight against corruption. Now, seeing the rising levels of corruption, we called that uh, team. And what we found was a very disorganized and dysfunctional uh, structure, which if it was focused, should have actually been the government spear uh, in fighting corruption. What we had on the cases that uh, were brought before us that had been resolved, where I think out of 42 cases, about 40 were all resolved through plea bargaining. A person who has uh, misused or caused the loss of millions of rents, 50 million, 60, 100 million, got five year suspended sentence and a fine of 20,000 rands or 30,000 rands. And that can hardly be a, a course of action that uh, uh, caused the corrupt to pause and, and you know, step back. And lastly, if I may, it relates to a decision by government to modernize its systems, modernize the systems and ensure that there is one system in government for financial management and human resource management. And this was the integrated financial management system. But you see, Chair, the system was conceptualized around 2005, six, but it had no business case. And until today, the business case was only done in November, December 2020 for a project that started uh, that long. And in between, there's been so much mismanagement, stopping and starting the, the process. Uh, there's been a forensic investigation that cost about 4.7 million rands, and no action has been taken against officials who mismanaged the system. So if government had managed that system well, probably we would not be sitting here and if we did, it would be under very different conditions. So for me, that is what I call the lack of political will. That is, you either do nothing or you take correct decisions, but then you don't implement them properly. Right. I'm going to come back to that issue, but I'm still trying in advance to summarize some of your key views. Sure. And the third point you make in paragraph 6.3 uh, about another feature during the same period that you say Scopa was doing its work properly, was you say the following, Parliament failed to track and monitor compliance by the executive of corrective, of corrective action proposed in Parliament's own adopted reports. That is another feature that you emphasize in your affidavit, is that correct? Very much so, Chair. I think if, if this did not happen, we, the parliamentary uh, track will not be here. Probably the speaker's office will be the only one coming here and saying, look, this is what we did to track, to track these things, but uh, it did not happen. And I will be coming back to that in some detail. 
And then fourthly, you say during the same period, Parliament failed to adopt any mechanism directed at compelling or encouraging ministers to ensure that such proposed corrective action was implemented. That's the fourth main theme in your affidavit. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And again, we will come back to that. Now, what I would like to turn to now, uh, but only in summary and overview, is what is addressed uh, in paragraphs 6.5 through to 6.18 of your affidavit, and just to focus very briefly and very generally on the way in which SCOPA went about its, its job. I think you've already emphasized, uh, just bear with me, um, uh, the, let, 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 let me, let me t let's start at paragraph 6.5. It's correct, is it not, that every year SCOPA is required to consider something of the order of 200 to 250 audit reports. Right. In other words, you have, you have a vast scope of material to deal with, uh, which, which emerges from the terms of reference of your committee that we've already looked at. Correct. What you do is you examine and then prioritize and then select where to focus on in particular. Is that correct? Well, as you indicated in the preceding paragraph, if you have 200 reports or 220 reports with the amount of time available for us as a committee, you certainly cannot um, have hearings on everything. So we had to prioritize. And it was not a guesswork on how we prioritize. There was a system, there was a process. Right. Now, before we look at that system, uh, the point you make in paragraph 6.7 is that all this documentation that routinely came to your committee revealed what you say, and I quote, a disturbingly high number of cases of unauthorized expenditure, irregular expenditure, fruitless and wasteful expenditure and other material non-compliance. Disturbingly high, you say. Well, look, Chair, our, our approach in SCOPA was that we want accountability for every cent of public money. But when you have unauthorized expenditure, irregular expenditure, fruitless and wasteful expenditure being counted in billions, surely for anyone who seeks to save the public good, that should be worrisome. And so what you explain in paragraph 6.8 is that your committee identified certain focus areas of particular concern, and I'm referring now to the fifth parliament, 2014 to 2019, and right up at the top of those is compliance with supply chain management prescripts. prescripts. Is that correct? That's very correct, because the above that we spoke to in the preceding paragraph are a product of non-compliance. From non-compliance as everything else flows. And you say in paragraph 6.8, you also prioritized internal controls, you pr prioritized unauthorized, irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure, and you prioritized, you make the point in 6.8.4, consequence management against officials who do not comply with legislation. Can we just pause there for a moment? And if you could just summarize your view on the problem of consequence management as you experienced it in the period during which you chaired SCOPA? If, you, if one looks at our resolutions, you will hardly find a resolution where we are not calling for action to be taken against uh, officials who have not uh, uh, complied with legislation. Because how, how then do you get things right if there are no consequences for doing uh, I'm talking here about the accounting officer in the first instance, uh, but also the executive authority, that is the ministers, because they get all these reports. Uh, and if you find that there is persistent non-compliance, uh, surely you should be interested in what action is taken. And that has been the pain of the public sector that they 
people who do not comply, um, action is not taken against them, or people who resign from this department and then just move to the next department as if nothing has happened, or move to a municipality or to a provincial department. And that, I believe, that sense of impunity uh, is what emboldened uh, the looters to continue as if they have a democratic right to be corrupt. Now, we're going to come back to that issue uh, over and over again, it seems to me. Uh, if I can just continue with the theme of just trying to give some understanding of how your committee went about its work, in paragraph 6.9, you say that the committee focused in hearings primarily on entities that were apportioned the largest budgets and on reports that disclosed the most serious level of financial management, financial mismanagement. Is that correct? It is, it is correct. Like I said, that uh, our uh, prioritization uh, had to, you know, be based on something. And we felt that uh, where you have the largest budgets and where you have uh, high levels of financial mismanagement, uh, that should be our area of interest. And may I share, if you may, link that up with the, the line above 6.8.8, uh, deviations and expansions. I must say that uh, this is, we discovered this to be another form or another area uh, of non-compliance where to circumvent uh, going through the tendering process, departments will always do deviations that is deviating from normal or expansions, that is, if you get a tender for 20 million and they say, no, because you're doing a good job, can we add another job for 5 million, just like that. And this has become the favorite route through which departments uh, avoid compliance. And Chair, I bet you, if you were to say, let's look at deviations and expansions, you would see it with frighteningly high amounts uh, that are involved. And this process is given a veneer of legality by National Treasury because it is the one that must okay this. But our own experience and search has been that uh, the process at National Treasury um, were not foolproof. And we actually once took deviations from Trustnet and said with National Treasury, and we as Copa said of all the requests that we have approved, not have approved any of them because they just don't make sense why they had to be done. So I, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, it is an area which uh, maybe has not really featured like regular expenditure, but it is one uh, area of high, very high and disturbing instances of non-compliance. And we had requested National Treasury to report to us on a quarterly basis on deviations and expansions, and the billions involved per quarter were quite staggering. Thank you. Now, I just want to refer you briefly to paragraph 6.10. I'm not going to take you to the annexure, but the annexure uh, that is referred there, the annexure TG1, is a document that lists voluminous hearings held, voluminous resolutions adopted, and voluminous oversight reports and that's just in respect of the period 2015 to 2018. Is that correct? I'm just trying to draw attention to the, to the volume of the work and the volume no, of the work. Very correct. 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 But then you deal in your affidavit, but we've already touched on this, on the question of creating a collegial spirit, so I won't go back to that. Uh, I would like to focus on paragraph 6.15. Now, there... You explained that before your tenure as chair of SCOPA, it had not been the committee's practice to require ministers to attend SCOPA hearings to account to SCOPA, but that you took a different view. Perhaps if you could just summarize very briefly the view you took and how that then played itself out. Well, our view was that uh, when departments or entities come, the, the ministers uh, under whom they fall should also come because the issues and the challenges that are there uh, should be of interest to them. And in cases of persistence, ministers should themselves actually explain to us what is it that they are doing uh, 
uh, to address the challenges that uh, uh, we were discussing. And in a number of occasions, Chair, we found that a minister has actually been misled by his officials. And ministers would say, but when we're discussing, you're very enthusiastic, you're very eloquent, but before scope, you are stammering and stuttering because they were telling the minister what they thought she would like to hear or she would like to hear, but before us, uh, it was not the case. So yes, ministers, we said they should come. They have a political responsibility. Right, thank you. Now I'd like to take you to page, uh, uh, or to paragraph 6.19 and following of the affidavit. We've already referred to this issue in summary, but I now want to refer to it in a little more detail. It's the section of your affidavit under the heading, The Persistence of Financial Mismanagement Despite Scopa's Efforts. And as a convenient reference point, you have attached to your affidavit uh, what we call the Scopa Legacy Report uh, for the Fifth Parliament. Now, we, there will be reference to other legacy reports in, the, in these hearings. But to, to, to very briefly and crudely summarize, is it correct that at the end of each five-year term of parliament, each committee, including SCOPA, would do a report on the five-year period, what it had learnt, uh, what it prioritized, and what it recommended should be prioritized by the next uh, incoming committee? Is that a fair summary? That's, that's a correct summary, yes. All right. Now, I'm not going to take you to the report itself, but I would like to take you to the extract from the report that is quoted in paragraph 6.20. Because this is, as I understand it, uh, a report issued by SCOPA under your chairmanship, as it were, at the termination of your period uh, as chair of SCOPA. In other words, fairly recently, just before the last elections. And uh, if I may say so, it sounds somewhat like a cry from the heart. It sounds to me like this is you trying to summarize, and that is long before this commission was uh, interested in this topic, your views on this issue. Uh, so I, I would ask you please to, to take us through what we read in paragraph 6.20, because this seems to summarize what you reported in your legacy report, which summarizes your experience. Yeah, well, Chair, uh, the six, Point two zero, the the quote from the chairperson's forward, that is my statement as the chairperson, which looks back and say what were the problems. Uh, as you can see there, uh, the first thing that I talked to is the fact that the exponential increase in irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure. Uh, was not a reflection on the effectiveness of the committee. Effectiveness in terms of doing our work as assigned by the rules of parliament. But that the lack of responsiveness to the recommendations of parliament from the executive was at the heart of it all. The lack of political and administrative will to do what is right for the country to stop the looting of public funds. Uh, and I, I also, in the second paragraph, just indicate that uh, we, we had called out the malfeasance in a number of entities and I've, I've picked up those that were very frequent or those that we considered uh, to have been right there on top, uh, but to no avail. Uh, I'm sure uh, you would have seen maybe some of the annex charts in relation to our solutions on the SABC or something like that. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, the relationship between parliament and the executive does need to be looked at as a, as a practical necessity, but also as a legal necessity. How is it that uh, uh, the judiciary makes rulings and say, you sentence this fellow to 10 years and the executive will respond by locking you up in prison for that period. But parliament says, we recommend that do ABCD to comply with the law and there is tardiness or there is, there is no response. If that is not uh, then oversight would actually become a ritual. Uh, I understand that the constitution says we must oversee it, we must hold to account, but I ask towards the end, uh, at the bottom, 
what is the enforcement mechanism of holding to account? We'll hold them to account, yeah, we call them, we tell them this is wrong and they agree, we say go and correct it, yes, yes we will, and then they don't. What is the enforcement mechanism in the absence of responsiveness? I think that's a legal and a political question that uh, needs to be, to be answered. Thank you. And I just want to highlight one uh, part of that passage that you didn't refer to. It's about the sixth line. And you say this, the executive branch is not responsive to the recommendations from parliament. There is not sufficient political and administrative will to do what is right for the country to stop the looting of funds. Is that a view that you formed on the basis of, of extensive uh, personal experience? Well, like I indicated at the beginning, I was there for 13 and a half years. And on an annual basis, we got these reports from the Auditor General. And they all made for, you know, depressing reading. And we had all these hearings where we highlighted, but the persistence was there. And actually the worsening of the situation was there. So there was no other conclusion to come up to than to say, well, the political leadership does not seem to have the way with us uh, to address this problem. Administrative leadership, that is the boards of entities and the DGs and their TTGs or executive management, we're just, we're just not doing that which is expected in terms of the law. All right, if I can move you on then to paragraph 6.12, which follows a similar theme. And I'm sorry, Mr. Friend. And it's, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Friend. Um, Mr. Gordy, uh, are you quite confident that uh, out of all those years during which you served as chairperson of SCOPA, and I think you said 18 years, I'm not sure, uh, effectively, the position is that the um, financial statements or reports relating to SOEs or certain important SOEs or all of them and government departments, wherever there had been reports that were not acceptable the previous year, the following year, Copa would raise the same issues again and uh, they would just not uh, be, uh, the response would not be one that uh, would be the right response from either uh, the ministers or the accounting officers. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, are you quite, conf quite confident that as a matter of fact, even if it's not all the entities, but those important SOEs and then maybe certain government departments, problems that had emerged in the previous year would be raised in the following year to say, what have you done about this? And uh, it would be year in, year out, and most of the time, the problems would not be addressed that SCOPA had raised, including problems that were pointed out in the AG's reports about such government departments and SOEs. Factually, do you, do you, do you, do you say that's likely to be the, uh, the position? Sure, I'm, I'm saying it very emphatically so, um, because we Scopa, maybe 99% of our times, we rely on the reports of the Auditor General. And those reports were submitted to Parliament and signed on by the Minister and the accounting officers as correct. Uh, indeed, like you have put the caveat, yes, you may find that this year uh, Department of Health has improved, but you find that agriculture has gone down but you will have others like your correctional services. Uh, the only other time correctional services is an unqualified audit 
was when we had seven, about seven hearings with them in one financial year. But even that unqualified audit, it was merely the fact that they disclosed everything. Not that it was clean. There were still huge, huge problems. So, yes, we, we, we have not been moving forward in terms of uh, controls and, and accountability. Well, um, I'm sure Mr. Friend will deal with this later, but I want to ask this question now. With the frustrations that I assume Scopa must have felt over the years, arising from uh, raising issues with the executive uh, year in, year out, and the issues not being addressed either at all for a number of years or not being addressed adequately. Uh, did it ever occur to Scopa that... Um, it should consider saying to the National Assembly the accounting officers, the DGs or chief executive officers of these boards and the boards themselves are not addressing serious problems involving taxpayers' money uh, for a number of years. And uh, the ministers concerned don't seem to take any action against um, uh, the chief executive, of, executive officers or DGs. This should be raised with the president, whoever the president was, to say this is unacceptable. This is how far, how long it has taken. Instead of improving, maybe the situation is deteriorating. This is taxpayers' money. And um, to then see what the president, whoever the president was, would do, and if he didn't do anything, uh, I would like to uh, find out whether you as COPA or maybe you yourself, because maybe you didn't discuss this, wouldn't feel that uh, that should uh, form grounds for the National Assembly to lose confidence in the president if under his uh, administration such things affecting taxpayers' money were not addressed and he was not uh, uh, doing anything about it or was not prepared to take necessary action. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, if, you, if one looks at uh, Scopus resolutions, which the National Assembly adopted, we always indicated that these are not new issues. These are persistent issues. Uh, in the Speaker's office, the office that uh, is responsible for oversight, it is the, uh, the House Chair for Committees, what we call the Chair of Chairs, um, I've had a uh, community frolic, uh, Obed Babela, and um, I would, uh, in our frequent engagements, highlight the fact that uh, we have these challenges. Uh, and they were also aware because the Auditor General also uh, shared his findings uh, with Parliament. So. The, the problem and the persistence of the problems were not a, a hidden factor to the leadership of parliament. Uh, through our, the reports that we gave, uh, and every time we made a request for meetings, you need to explain what the meeting about. And our meetings always indicated, this is what we want to do, this is how we want to do it. And it will then have to go to the chief whip uh, for approval. So, the, the, the key officers in parliament uh, were very much aware of the things that we're dealing with. And I must say that towards the end of our tenure, I do remember uh, there was a time when our committee whip, Comrade Nyami Boy, uh, actually met the then president, uh, President Zuma, and gave him a copy of um, the, the 
the, the, the text we got from the Auditor General, a document uh, from the Auditor General. We also shared it with the then Deputy President, the current President, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. He shared it with the Chief Whip uh, of the ANC, uh, the late Jackson Temple, who I must say never put roadblocks on our work, always supported us to say, look, these are the things that we are dealing with. Uh, I think also Minister Jojo, in a capacity as something sitting in the ANC. So, yes, but in terms of a formal resolution that says this is what we need to do, uh, we did not do that. Uh, we're also alive to the dynamics that I started with. Uh, for yeah. such a motion to yeah. succeed. Mm. Yes, continue. Yeah, I was saying that for, for such a motion to succeed, firstly, uh, within SCOPA, uh, it, would, it would need the support of the ANC because all committees, they are a majority. Then from there, the, the, the programming committee must agree to to program it, and then in the house, the ANC must support it. So sometimes you look at the political dynamics and, and you already understand the limits of what can and or cannot be done. No, I, under I understand. Uh, but from what you are saying, part of what you are saying is that in the end, a lot of things in parliament that may, may be necessary to be done can't be done or won't be done if the majority party doesn't support those things. So in the end, very often you come down to that. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Mr. Mr. Fringe? Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I will come back to that. Uh, I, I would just prefer just to lay a little bit more of a foundation before I come back to it. Uh, and I was at paragraph 6.21 of the affidavit, and we were looking at the legacy report uh, at the end of the fifth parliament. And what we see in paragraph 6.21 uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. refers to a number of the people. I'm sorry again, Mr. Friend. Uh, to interrupt you, we didn't take the tea break at quarter past 11 because we had had some, we had wasted, we had lost some time. It's 12 o'clock, I think we should take it now, at uh, 15 minutes, sure. uh, because it's uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, quarter past 12, we'll resume. We are Jen. Thank you, Chair.
Essi. Thank you. Mr. Kodi. We're just testing again. We're about to start. Can you hear me, Essi? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kodi, are you there? Yeah. Thank you, sir. See that? Okay, let's continue. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Gori, can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gori, I was about to take you to paragraph 6.21. And this is just summarizing a summary. Your legacy report summarizes the views you held and reported at the end of the fifth parliament. And this paragraph summarizes what you said there. It talks about a disregard of applicable legislation, including, for example, the PFMA and the Treasury regulations by officials and senior management. It talks about a lack of consequence management for officials responsible for non-compliance with legislation. Uh, and it talks about scope recommendations not being implemented. Is that a fair summary of what you said in your legacy report? Yeah, no, that's very correct, Chair. It, it what is, I'd like to do is just to illustrate that by reference to some examples. So if we could go to paragraph 6.22, and you will see there there's a reference to annexure TG3. That annexure, uh, Chair, is in bundle one, starting at page 156. That's the PO1 number on the top left. And Mr. Gordy, if you could have a look at that, uh, at that uh, annexure, and I'm going to take you to a particular page in it shortly, but just so that we can get our bearings, if you go to page, bundle one, page 157, Accounting authority and management seem not to 
Operations Management, Financial Management, and Intelligence Services identified in the audit report, especially, especially as some of these matters have been raised in the audit previous year, of previous years. Now, now did that report on reflect what you found in this particular uh, oversight exercise? slash 2019 financial statements. And uh, uh, Chair, just for your reference, although I'm not going to take you there, that's at bundle uh, one, page 204. All I want to refer you to is the extract that we see in 6.23.6, where Mr. Gordy, you say in your affidavit, I pointed out in the introduction, which is of this report, uh, the following, that, that in the introduction, the following is stated. Despite several hearings having been held with the SABC during the Fifth Parliament and oversight visit that the committee undertook in March 2017, the audit outcomes have not given an indication of improvement in the SABC's financial performance. So I take it this is just another illustrative example of what you've been trying to tell the Chair about. Thank you. Now, I want to move on to the portion of your affidavit that starts at page 13. Under the heading, absence of effective mechanisms to ensure, yes, I don't really want to get engaged in a long legal debate with you now. And you say in paragraph 6.26, Scopa speaks chiefly through its reports, which are tabled before parliament. And then you say in paragraph 6.29, Scopa's reports would, in the ordinary course, be adopted by the National Assembly. Have I got all that correct? Yes, that's, uh, that's correct, Chair. Um, we, as a committee, we're a committee of Parliament. Whatever work we do, we do it on behalf of Parliament. So <clears throat> we then need to report to Parliament, and it is Parliament that must then adopt uh, uh, the reports. And I must say that uh, I don't remember any Report of Scopa uh, being rejected by the House. Uh, all our reports to the House were always debated. Were always debated. We we requested, we were granted uh, the fact that all our reports would be. Yes, we didn't have enough time because sometimes we, we always submit three, four reports at the same time. But the time we had would be thirty minutes, forty minutes. And surely that was not enough, but at least there were debates on, on the reports that we submitted. And what you also tell the chair is that as a matter of uh, usual experience, the scope of reports uh, would be adopted uh, by the National Assembly as, as approved by Parliament. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, there was always this understanding that uh, whatever scope brings, uh, the House would not have issues because the assumption is that uh, the committee does a very thorough job and no one would want to stand up and say, no, we don't think their stance against corruption is wrong, we must defend this. So it was almost given that our report would be adopted, but that adoption what did it mean and what effect and impact did it have beyond adoption? That's the issue I'm going to come to if you just give me a minute or two. So I'd like to take you to your paragraph 6.28. You, you say there the following. In the period during which I chaired SCOPA, all of our reports contained recommendations as regards required corrective action. For example, our reports would request certain ministers to report to Parliament 
on specified steps taken to address particular issues within a given period. And then you continue in brackets, some reports requested the speaker to repeat requests made in earlier reports until such time that there was compliance. Now, I take it that's factually correct, is it? Yes, it is. And what you say in paragraph 6.30 is that generally the office of the speaker would issue requests to ministers in accordance with GOPA reports. Is that correct? That's correct, Chair. And every time the speaker wrote to a minister, I would be copied. So I would know that uh, the adopted resolution has been communicated to the relevant minister. Well, if I may say so, so far so good. It looks we have like a system that's functioning. But you then continue in paragraph 6.31 as follows. But there was no structured mechanism in place to follow up adequately and ultimately to hold the executive accountable. In my view and the view of the committee, this severely hamstrung the exercise of adequate oversight. Committee members became increasingly frustrated with the lack of responsiveness of the executive. Could you maybe just elaborate on that, please? Well, Chair, uh, may I say that in as much as I've ever said that whenever the speaker um, wrote to the relevant minister uh, forwarding uh, the house resolutions, I was copied. I have never received, or I was never copied of any letter of follow-up from the speaker's office on any of those resolutions that were passed, indicating that uh, the, the resolutions that were forwarded to the ministers and the timeframes given uh, are, being, are being pursued. So we would go to the house, debate the resolutions, adopt them, and I will be copied the letters from the speaker to the relevant ministers. And that is where it basically ended. Right. Now, you deal with the obvious consequence of that with, in paragraph 6.32. You say there, in an effort to remedy this, I approached the chair of chairs, Mr. Cedric Froelich, sometime during the Fifth Parliament. He gave me an assurance that the office of the speaker would configure a so-called dashboard, which would keep track of deadlines and follow up and ensure compliance with all House resolutions. Can you confirm that? Well, Chair, um, I can confirm that uh, this is factually correct, that uh, members of SCOPA uh, were quite frustrated with this, dealing with the same things almost year in and year out. And I must say that uh, I, I had a very good working relationship with uh, Comrade Cedric Frolic, and he had an open door policy with me that uh, any time I needed any assistance, I could knock on his door. So it was easy for me to go and raise this issue about uh, the fact that the committee is unhappy. And um, I must say that he appeared genuinely convinced that uh, the dashboard was going to be, uh, was going to be configured uh, as a matter of time and they will be able to track. The concern was not just about scope and resolutions, but it was just about the business of the house. Uh, of course, I had gone there for SCOPA, but he acknowledged that uh, not only in relation to SCOPA, but generally in relation to most of the resolutions in the House, they are not able to get feedback uh, timelessly and promptly from the executive. But so, this did not happen. Well, that's my next question. What happened, if anything? Did it happen? Did it come about? Is it in place to this day? Well, it, it, uh, it did not happen um, and it remained a sore point in the committee and there was no uh, indication of um, uh, what transpired. By the time I left parliament in May, 2019, there was no such dashboard configured, meaning there was still no system to track, to monitor uh, the resolutions, compliance with the resolutions of the House, or at least responses uh, to the resolutions of the House from the executive. 
Now, you're talking about an approach you made to the chair of chairs uh, in the time that you were chair of SCOPA, but I'd like to refer you to paragraph 6.37 of your affidavit. That refers to a document which the chair will be hearing quite a bit about in the course of these hearings, known as the Oversight and Accountability Model adopted by Parliament in 2009. Are you familiar with that document, Mr. Gordy? Correct. And chair, just for your, for your uh, benefit, but I'm not going to take you there now, that's to be found in the reference bundle at uh, 1-48 and following. Now, the evidence from various witnesses will be that this was the product of the consideration by structures of parliament as to how they should, how they should deal with the question of oversight and accountability. And you will see in this 2009 document, paragraph 4.1.4 commences as follows. In developing the oversight model, the need was identified, I stress, this is published in 2009, for support services relating to the monitoring and tracking of issues between Parliament and the executive, and on all other related matters within Parliament's broader mandate. An oversight and advisory section ought to be created in response to the need identified. Its main functions will be to provide advice, technical support, coordination and tracking and monitoring mechanisms on issues arising from oversight and accountability activities of members of parliament and the committees to which they belong. Now, my question to you, Mr. Gordy, is to the best of your knowledge, has any of this ever been implemented? Well, Chair, uh, it has not been implemented. And I, I must say my understanding uh, was that uh, between 1994 and 2004, the focus was on dismantling the uh, apartheid legislative architecture and trying to align it with the new constitution. And not that we are done with that. I think there's still lots of apartheid uh, laws that are still in our statute. But from 2004, there was now this focus on oversight. And that's why this model was developed. It was an extensive process, consultation, debates, discussions, but like we spoke about the executive earlier on implementation, because when, when I went to Cumbria, I did not even look at this um, oversight model. It merely arose from the concerns of members on the lack uh, of a tracking mechanism. But yes, you are correct. Here it is, uh, something that should have been done, not because we've made a request, but because parliament had committed itself to doing it and has not done it. Right, thank you. Now, I want to draw attention to another uh, uh, recommendation in the OVAC model. If I can refer you to page, to paragraph 6.4040 of your affidavit, it's bundle one, page 118. Again, it's not necessary to go to the document because we've quoted the relevant paragraph. And the paragraph reads as follows. It is recommended that Parliament develop rules to assist it further in sanctioning cabinet, minister, cabinet members for non-compliance after all established avenues and protocols have been exhausted. For example, naming the cabinet minister by the speaker of the National Assembly uh, or the chairperson, there's a typographical error, or the chairperson of the council based on full explanation. And I see you say in your affidavit, you support that recommendation. Chair, the, that phenomenon of, um, uh, of uh, the speaker uh, naming members of parliament is, is not a new one. On many occasions when members of parliament, be they MPs or cabinet ministers, are deemed to have, <clears throat> to have engaged in some trans transgressions, uh, there are instances where the speaker would call the member to stand up and that member be given a dressing down, down right, in the, right in the house. 
So the, the paragraph that uh, we've just quoted actually extends it specifically to when ministers do not respond to the resolutions of the House. And I, I fully support it because the previous paragraph that you quoted said there should be a mechanism to follow up. But then when you follow up and there's no response, then what do you do? So this last paragraph actually provides a mechanism. Uh, shame them, call them out so that the, the house and the public will know that he is a delinquent uh, uh, minister or, or whatever. So it was a mechanism, it is a mechanism that uh, should actually have been applied. Thank you. Now I want to move on to a slightly different issue. Um, you referred at an earlier stage in overview to your view about the importance when we understand, when we analyze parliamentary oversight that we have regard to the political realities. And I'd like to take you to paragraph 6.35 of your affidavit. It's bundle one, page 117. Can you repeat six point? 35, three five. Oh, okay. And perhaps if you could just talk to this issue and elaborate on your views in relation to the implications of, uh, of a parliament that is dominated by one strong party uh, and the relevance of politics to this oversight question we're talking about. Well, Chair, uh, what I mean here is that uh, uh, the political dynamics within the party that uh, has the majority in the House will certainly uh, determine how parliamentary work is done. Because like I said, at the end of the day, oversight uh, is heavily impacted upon by politics. And I can tell you that uh, I've seen in parliament how members of various political parties will come to the house on a particular issue with a political mandate on the stance to take and reason and facts will not sway them otherwise. So politics remain a, um, a determinant. And this sometimes, unfortunately, and especially with the majority party, you would see it in the work of the portfolio committees. And I say this with no malice, that uh, many of our comrades in the portfolio committees were very pliable and acted like uh, useful idiots of the executive. Uh, if I can use that word, in terms of not playing oversight, but having instances where they would actually uh, defend officials uh, in meetings uh, instead of assisting oversight to the point where members of SCOPA from the ANC, from the EFF, from the DA would actually uh, request that I should never schedule joint uh, hearings with portfolio committees because they felt uh, there were a hindrance to effective oversight. So whatever the political dynamics were, but there were a lot of our, uh, 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 of our colleagues uh, in the portfolio committees who were actually uh, uh, an embarrassment to the notion of uh, public represent representation and, and to oversight itself. So I believe that uh, it, is, it, is, it is the political dynamics uh, that play themselves out either as an enabler of oversight or as a hindrance to oversight. I'd like to turn to a related issue, and that is the consequence to individual members of parliament if they do stand up and insist on exercising uh, appropriate oversight. Could you comment on that uh, with reference uh, to yourself, to members of, uh, of your own SCOPA committee and any other uh, committees of which you have any knowledge? Well, Chair, I am not in parliament because the IEC said uh, the people of this country did not uh, vote for me or did not see value in me. That's, that's okay. Uh, but I think political parties uh, must display seriousness to the question of oversight and especially the fight against corruption. And I'll make two examples. <clears throat> um, 
take the TA. We had a member there, Tim Brautersen, who is a qualified forensics expert. And we used him a lot in Scopa uh, when we're dealing with the police, with correctional services. He did a lot of work for us to empower us as a committee. But uh, after these elections, the DA did not retain him. Uh, understand he's somewhere in the NCOP and they have new members in Scopa. Uh, you look at the ANC, uh, I don't know whether it is coincidence, but all Scopa members from the ANC were not returned to parliament. Now, here are your members who serve in the best committee in parliament and have shown diligence uh, in fighting corruption and in advocating for good governance. And you feel those people are not worthy of being retained and you have new members all together in that committee. So I, I, I think that uh, yes, the talk is there, but we must demonstrate that talk. I don't know what the dynamics are within uh, the ANC, but I know that always uh, we would talk in the corridors that uh, the stand that they were taking was going to have negative consequences for their political career, so to speak. And for those that I had uh, in the fifth parliament, all of them, all of them, not even one has gone back to parliament. And tell me that it's, it's mere coincidence. Mr. Gordy, I want to just deal with one last aspect in your affidavit before I turn to the, the uh, draft affidavit of Mr. McQuerty. At the end of your affidavit, you deal with the recent statutory amendments to the Public Audit Act. And I think the committee, the, the commission has already heard evidence that the amended legislation gives the Auditor General's Office certain uh, additional powers. Uh, if you could maybe just comment on your views on, on that legislation. Well, Chair, um, uh, I just two comments for me. Firstly, uh, this act gives someone or a body outside the executive or the accounting officers and authorities uh, the responsibility to do their work. Essentially, the AG must now chase after the thieves, uh, after the thieving ministers and officials, because uh, they can't help themselves. It's, it's impulsive. So they need someone uh, outside themselves to do it. I, I have personally, um, in as much as we supported the act, because at the end of the day, we needed to have something, but in principle, I've stood uh, opposed to this act and have said so in public, and I repeat so, that uh, it, is, it is a shame, it is shameful that ministers and the accounting officers and authorities cannot deal with corruption and must now delegate this responsibility to a constitutional structure. And that parliament connived uh, in that process. Uh, it's, it's a poor reflection on us because if our people are now going to rely on our constitutional bodies on matters that should be handled by elected officials, then what is the relevance uh, of parliament? What is the relevance of elected officials? I, I think that uh, this is a very, very wrong legislation to the extent that it actually acknowledges that our system is unresponsive and therefore uh, we give up on it being able to deal with the shameful looting of public funds, which derive, denies our people uh, the right to time years and quality services. Mr. Gordy, I'd like to change track completely now. I'd like to refer you to the unsigned draft affidavit of Mr. McQuerty, which is to be found in the four on page 847 onwards. Can I, just a minute, can I just uh, change my files? Uh, just before you proceed, Mr. Fringe, can I ask 
Another question to Mr. Gordy uh, relating to something in his affidavit. Um, this phenomenon, Mr. Gordy, register. This phenomenon you have told me about of uh, all ANC members of SCOPA not being retained. Is that something that happened at the end of one particular term of parliament five years? Or is it something that happened, something similar had happened during other terms, as far as you know? Or is that something you don't know? Well, in the previous terms, um, what happened was that uh, I think since I came to Scopa, the only person who had been retained uh, in the committee was Comrade Vincent Smith. But, yes. Uh, all other members uh, had, um, had not been retained uh, and did not come back to parliament. It was only Comrade Tapelo Chilwane who joined us during the course of the of the fifth parliament. Uh, but uh, in the in the other parliaments, uh, every time we were like starting a new. But in this instance, in the sixth parliament, uh, there is no one uh, who is even a member of parliament that you could say maybe they could have retained. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Friend. Thank you, Judge. Um, Mr. Gordy, uh, have you now got access to the draft affidavit of Mr. Mukwetu, which starts at page 847 of Bundle 4? Yes, I, I, I have had uh, access to, to the bundle, and I had time to go through it and consider the, uh, the contents thereof. Right. Now, I'd like to ask you just a general question. Having read this long, detailed, and if I may say so, depressing affidavit, what is your view in general terms about the content of that affidavit? Well, Chair, I fully identify with the contents because the things that uh, uh, Mr. Makwetu had raised here are issues that are of public knowledge because they are they are extracted from the annual reports or annual audit reports uh, of the Auditor General. Uh, the views that he has expressed on these facts um, overall are views that are consistent with uh, the views that we would share from time to time, either in official meetings or whenever we met uh, unofficially and informally and, 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 and discuss issues of oversight. And would it be fair to say that you had a, a, a reasonably regular and reasonably close relationship with Mr. Mukwetu? You were familiar with his views uh, and, and you had uh, regular discussions? Well, look, that's correct. Remember, SCOPA <clears throat> is the one committee that uh, uses the reports of the Auditor General more than any other committee. Uh, but but also beyond beside, beside our official work, you know, uh, Mr. Mokwetu's late uncle was my leader in the PAC. So there was that personal touch, and we we'll discuss issues much more relaxed than uh, than maybe some of his predecessors. So yes, we we interacted a lot. I could access him anytime. And any time he wanted to access me, he would he would do so, and there would be no hassle. So yes, we interacted uh, fairly uh, regularly, fairly well. I must say. And, and having read this affidavit, I think you've now read it more than once. Uh, could you tell the the uh, chair 
whether what you read in this affidavit is consistent with what he would be saying to you in your dealings with him. Yeah, by and large, that's why I said the, the views, firstly, the evidence that he has presented in terms of uh, uh, narrating what transpired in Transnet, it's a matter of public record. His interpretation of those facts uh, are, from what I've read, they're very consistent with the, what I would uh, think should be his hearings or his views or where his views matter. Yes, if I can just uh, clarify, you made a mention of Transnet. I was wondering whether you were intending to refer to Prasa. Oh, Prasa. Sorry, Prasa, yes, Prasa. Now, can you please turn to page 871 in bundle four? I'm sorry, what is that reference, Mr. Friend, again? 871, bundle 4, P004871. And in particular to paragraph 61. One. 61, 61. Yes, yes, I have it. Do you have it? Uh, Chair, do you have it? I've got it. Thank you, Mr. Friend. Thank you, Chair. Now, uh, Mr. Gordy, if we look at the table in paragraph 61, it's really summarizing a lot of what appears in the rest of this affidavit. And it's talking about irregular expenditure within PRASA and the developments on an annual basis. So if we look at the right-hand column, uh, you will see that what he deals with initially he deals with five annual periods, 2013, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18. And if we look at the right, he says in the 2013, 2014 year, the irregular expenditure is 0 0.01 billion. In the next annual period, it's a little over half a billion. Over the next annual period, it's more than 15 billion. In the next annual period, it's more than 20 billion. And in the next annual period, it's more than 24 billion. Now, what, what's your comment on those facts? Uh, I, I think um, one of the uh, reports in his, uh, one of the aspects in his uh, uh, general report general reports was to focus on a regular expenditure. And what we noticed, uh, not just for PRASA, but overall, on an annual basis, there was an increase uh, in irregular expenditure. And what this tells you is that uh, the compliance levels, if the rules and regulations uh, were not being followed, and it tells you that there is a progressive deterioration uh, in financial controls, in operational controls. And that uh, is at the heart of it all, because in as much as chair, we say that irregular expenditure does not mean that uh, there was corruption. But what it means is that the rules that have been put in place and the process that have been put in place have not been followed. And we always argue that those rules are not there for decoration. They are there to be followed. And what nefarious reason is there for not following the rules? Uh, and also taking into account that the people who are supposed to implement these rules are not just common idiots picked up in the street. These are professionals who are actually specialists in financial management. So if you find instances where there is no uh, compliance, surely it is a red flag, it is a warning sign. But uh, Mr. Godi, um you might uh, not be able to say anything about this, but uh, this is really shocking. I mean, even in, in regard to Prasa, I've had a lot of evidence about uh, allegations of corruption at Prasa, but even in regard to Prasa, to have a situation where in the 2013-2014 financial year, irregular expenditure is zero comma 
1 billion, and in the following year, it goes up quite substantially, uh, about ha half a billion irregular expenditure. I mean, the following year, financial year, 2015, 2016, you have 15,3 billion rand irregular expenditure. How the previous year, it was bad enough being half a billion, but it was not even one billion. The following year, financial year, is 15 billion. And as if that is not enough, the following financial year is 20,3 billion. And of course, 2017, 2018, is 24,2 billion. I mean, what kind of thing is that? I mean, where are the people who are supposed to make sure that these rules are complied with? As you say, irregular expenditure doesn't necessarily mean it's corruption. But when it is at this level and happening the way this table seems to show, there would be great suspicion that a substantial part of it is corruption, as far as I'm concerned. But how is it possible? Where is the relevant minister if the CEO uh, is not doing his job, if the board is not doing his job? Where is the president who should be getting reports about the state of affairs of um, SOEs who should be told about this situation at Prasa? Where, where are the politicians? What are they doing? And, and then, of course, we go back to Parliament. Parliament gets told about this. Scopa does what, he, what, what it can. The National Assembly becomes aware of this. Year in, year out, pa pa National Assembly can see that the people at Prasa are not taking note of any disapproval from Scopa about this level of expenditure every year. Actually, it looks like each time a Scopa says something, they, said, they say we are going to show Scopa, we are, they are not going to deter us. The following financial year, it's worse. How does one explain this? It's as if they, 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 there is no government. It's as if there is no leadership. It's as if government doesn't care about taxpayers' money that how taxpayers' monies are used at Prasa. It's shocking. And I guess it, it just, uh, it just uh, confirms what you said earlier on, that as COPA you would raise issues, and the issues were the same every year, and they were not being sorted out, and you would tell the National Assembly in your reports, and nothing would happen. That's what it, it says, I guess. Chair, if, if, if I may, and I'm sure you would feel for members of Scopa because now you are looking at PRASA and we had to look at everything because the Auditor General will then write the cumulative total of all the irregular expenditure within uh, the national government as well as uh, the provinces. And it was really, really heartbreaking. At least for those of us who wanted to do good for our people. We knew that these wasted monies were supposed to change the lives of people out there in the rural areas, out there in the informal settlements, but who are unable to get services because money is being expended uh, in ways that are contrary to the provisions of, of the laws and leg of, of, of legislation. Yeah. Now, no, I, no. I want to, if I may, oh, sorry, Judge. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm just sh shocked. Uh, I'm just terribly shocked. Yes, you, you may proceed, Mr. Friend. No, thank you, Judge. Uh, I, I want through you, Mr. Gordy, just very briefly to give a sense of what this affidavit of Mr. McQuitus does. Um, because it lays a foundation for some further questions that I want to ask you. Can I ask you please to go to paragraph 43, to page 863 of bundle four? 
Uh, did you say 863? 863, paragraph 42. Yeah. Yes. No, you know, as somebody who has read this affidavit, you will know that this is just a foundation for the rest of this affidavit. What Mr. McQuitt is showing in his affidavit, in his draft affidavit, is basically the procedures that he goes through and his office goes through. And he says, the Auditor General Office engaged and continue to engage with the following oversight structures to assist in exercising their own oversight functions. And he starts with the board or the administrator during times when PRASA was under administration. And may I say that he uses PRASA simply to illustrate uh, the more general problem. Secondly, the Audit and Risk Committee, which is a subcommittee of the board, he says currently not in place, that's due to the particular exigencies of PRASA. Thirdly, the Executive Authority, who in this case would be the Minister of Transport. And then only fourth and fifth, the Portfolio Committee on Transport and SCOPA. And he spends a lot of his affidavit dealing not only with the Portfolio Committee and with SCOPA, but with the anterior levels of oversight with which he engages. Uh, can you confirm that? I, I want to confirm that uh, it is correct. And um, I think the, that the process was intensified under, uh, or started under Mr. Mokwetu's predecessor, uh, Terence Nombele, uh, to say, look, as auditors, let us not just look at the numbers and write reports. We are South Africans, we are patriots, we have a duty to contribute to our country. Let's take a step further. So, you see, uh, Chair, by the time PRASA comes to SCOPA, their board has been engaged by the Auditor General on the problems and what needs to be done. The Audit and Risk Committee within PRASA would have been engaged. The minister would have been engaged. So by the time they appear before parliament, they are, we are not dealing with new issues. We are dealing with issues that they have been engaged in. But in most cases, they're not. Uh, if you look at the recordings of our hearings, you find officials who sometimes act as if they've just woken up from a sleep or they don't, they don't understand or don't have an idea about the annual reports, which is their product. And what we have here with Prasa Chain is what the Auditor General's Office does with every department and every entity. Uh, and I know it is not added here, but I do know that the Auditor General would actually address cabinet at the end of the audit process to say, look, this is what we have. These are the things that are there, but they will still address individual ministries, not only once, throughout the year, they will seek to engage them almost on a quarterly basis. So when they come to parliament and say things are wrong, it's not as if something has just emerged from behind the bushes. It is something that they've been dealing with throughout the year with the Auditor General. So as far as you know, I'm sorry, Mr. Fringe. So as far as you know, uh, the Auditor General and in particular, Mr. Makwetu, used to address cabinet uh, at certain points to point out to them the challenges that his office was finding with regard to various departments and SOEs. Is that what you are saying? What I'm saying is that at the end of like, the Auditor General brief cabinet about the audit outcomes, the overall audit outcomes, the picture that emerges or that is emerging from the audit process. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yes, so, so, so I didn't hear you said at the end of, is, is it a financial year or what? At, at the end of the audit process, remember- Jay, Or at the end the of financial the- Financial year- Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, at, at, at the end, Go ahead. I'm saying at the end of the cycle, 
when the annual reports have been submitted to parliament and he has drafted his general report. The general report summarizes his views of the audit cycle, that this audit cycle, these are the key things that have emerged. He will then share those overviews with the cabinet. Which means that whoever was a member of cabinet at any particular time when um, Mr. Makwetu or the Auditor General would have briefed cabinet can be expected to have had a picture of what the challenges are in regard to these types of issues that were of concern to the Auditor General. And if they wanted to know more, they would have known how to find the reports of the AG to get to know more about what was happening. Would that be correct? Chair, in the first instance, each cabinet would have had this briefing mm. with the AG on his or her own portfolio. Mm. So when they go to cabinet, mm. then give them the bigger picture to say, mm. your portfolio is performing in this context, is performing like this, but the broader context within which your performance is evaluated is this. Yes. No, no, that, 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 that's important. That, what you are saying says two, two things. One, in regard to each portfolio, each minister would have had this interaction uh, with the AG, or at least the report relating to, the AG's report relating to his or her department. But apart from knowing about the situation in his or her department, when the briefing is made by the AG to the whole, to the cabinet, they would get to know what the position is in other departments and other SOEs. And therefore, they would have a good picture of what the situation is. That's what you are saying. Correct. Correct. And, uh, and uh, that, uh, raises the question uh, that if that is factually true, the question that would arise is to the extent that this commission might find that certain things were brought to their attention that uh, they should have done something about, and nothing was done about those things, there may be no reason why they should not all be held liable, because then they were told. You, you don't have to comment on that, but I'm just thinking aloud that the implications of this, if it's factually true, would raise those questions. That they knew what the picture, big picture was. Chair. Yes. Yes, Mr. Godi. Chair, I, I just want to say, I just want to say that at least what is confirmed in the draft affidavit of Mr. Mr. Makwetu yes. is that is that the the means in relation to his or her portfolio. Mm does get the briefing, but I'm yes. very sure that yes. the cabinet briefed the end yes. Yes. of each cycle. Yes, no, no, that, that, that's, that's fine. Mr. Fringe? And, yes, thank you. Could I just following up on that, and I don't know if you know this or not, Mr. Gordy, but if you do, you could help us. The Auditor General is governed by legislation which prescribes the duties of the Auditor General. And to put it very crudely and briefly, the Auditor General is required to audit a whole slew of public entities, entity by entity, and 
the Auditor General's comments become part of the reports that are required by law to be submitted to Parliament and are submitted to Parliament. You agree with me so far? Yeah, no, that's correct. That's why when you read out the rules that establish scope, it talks about the report of the Auditor General on the financial statements. Yes, but now I want to take that a little step further. As I understand it, but I might be wrong, and if you're able to correct me, I'd be grateful. As I understand it, there is also a statutory duty on the Auditor General to produce a single combined annual report. And that too, not only that too, amongst others, is submitted to Parliament. Is that correct? That's correct. So when we talk about uh, whether or not a, a, a specific matter is raised in cabinet meetings, which I certainly have no knowledge one way or the other, what we should know is this, that government as a whole, and therefore all cabinet ministers, have access annually to the Auditor General's annual report, which gives annually an overview of the sorts of issues that we've been talking about. Can you confirm that? All right. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Friend. No. Mr. Friend. Yes, sir. Uh, I think we have gone past one o'clock. Uh, we both didn't keep an eye on the watch. Um, let's take <laughs> the lunch break. Uh, it's now about 13 minutes past one. We will resume at quarter past two. We are Jen. As you. Thank you.